thank you. Thank you so much for that intro. Thank you for being here. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're not asleep after lunch. It was a delicious lunch. Um, while the slides come up, I, the counter shouldn't count down until my slides come up, by the way. Um, I wrote a book. That's what we're here to talk about today. I wrote a, well, in many different ways. I wrote a book. Uh, we have like 18-ish of them. And so I'm going to give some away today. And then if you, if you think a signature from me is cool, I don't really think it is. But if you want it, I'll do that. <laughs> I was here for a signing yesterday. Um, yeah, so come get it. So we're going to give this away in many different ways. Way number one, I want you to go on social media and use the hashtag React Paris and mention me. And the first, the first 15 of those will get a, a book like for free. Like, no, and this is 60 euros, by the way. It's too expensive if you ask me, but <laughs> I, I don't set this. O'Reilly does, whatever. Don't put that in the recording. Um, but yeah, first 15 uh, posts, uh, hashtag React Paris and mention me. That's at Tejas Kumar underscore. And you'll, you'll get this for free. Uh, no cost, no strings attached. I mean, it's coming. Am I in trouble? Is, it's not connected. Oh, that's true. That's why I don't have, it's my mistake. <laughs> I just didn't plug in. Thank you. I was waiting for this. OK, slides. Good morning. What? That's probably going to do some handshake and come up. So yes, hope you're posting on social media. There you go. That's my hand. Um, that's for 15 books we have. Three extra ones here, and I want to play a very chaotic game with you, okay, as a, as a giveaway. He told me not to move. I'm sorry. Um, uh, giveaway, uh, which is I want you all to get ready to stand up and run if you want this book. <laughs> I'm going to place it here, and the first one to get it gets it, okay? And it could happen that nobody cares. Even better, okay? <laughs> ready? So get, get ready. And the first one that gets it, gets it. And the first three gets it, OK? Ready? One, two, three. Go get it! <laughs> That's so cool. Give it up for the participants there, man. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you. So OK, I've, unfortunately, I spent three minutes on that. That's too much. Um, welcome to the talk. Hi. Um, I'm, my name is Tejas. I've been building on the web for over 20 years at a number of different companies, e either as an employee or as a consultant or some combination of those. And in those years, I've, I've, I've been able to really appreciate and enjoy the web platform. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Specifically, I wrote a book on React that some of you have. Um, and this is Things You Should Know. And that book uh, is here. There's about 20 copies for you. Um, if you want a signature, that's cool. If you don't, I, I also don't want my own signature. Um, but here's things you should know. And so um, if you want to find the book, there's a QR code. You're welcome to scan it, buy it, um, whatever you want. I'll leave that up there for a second. But I want to get your input, because this is the title of the talk. I wrote a book on React, um, Things You Should Know. And there's really two paths we can take this talk. This is actually two talks, but we'll have to pick one, OK? One we prefer. I could talk about the book and, and how, you, how you can write a book and the ideation process, and should you write a book, especially now that we have AI and things like that, does it matter, right? We could talk about all of that for you as a programmer to write or read a book as a medium of learning. So we can talk about that, and the process of productivity and deadlines, we could talk about that. So it's like more soft skills, okay? Or we could just be like, show me the code, a technical, let's just talk about the interesting things from React in the book, things like use deferred value and use transition and async rend concurrent rendering, all of this. So, I'm going to let you choose. This is your opportunity. Show me your hand if you want the more soft skills, productivity. How do I write a book? OK, that's 34%. Uh, um, how many of you want the, like, just tell me about React and use tra Yeah, good, React Paris. Great, that's why we're here. Fantastic, OK. Let's, for the other side, we'll make up the time. I have like 25 minutes. OK, so let's talk about code specifically. Thank you, by the way, for participating. Choose your own adventure. So code. React is a tool that has been around for now 11, going soon to be 11 years. Um, how many of you have written React for more than five years? How many? Wow, OK. How many of you have written React for 10 years? Yeah, like five in this full room. OK, I've written React for 10 years. The book is about not how to use React. It's, it's about how React works inside. How many of you know how React works inside? Like, you feel confident. I can re-implement React in a small way. <laughs> Every hand went down except one, maybe. 
the book is that. It's the underlying mechanism. It contains actual like snippets from GitHub slash Facebook slash React. Like it's showing you the source code and telling you what it means. Okay, it's that type of book. So it may not be for you if you're not curious about that. React was made with two focuses in mind. Number one, DX, that's the developer experience. How can we give you a declarative abstraction so that you don't have to concern yourself with implementation details? With APIs like document.createElement, document.appendChild. These are native web platform APIs. But for, some, for the vast majority of like developers, it can be, if you don't know carefully what you're doing, you can run into issues. For example, reading document.innerWidth or element.innerWidth, as far as I know, triggers a layout recalculation. Just reading, reading a size property, right? And so React abstracts on this and makes it deterministic and, and predictable, meaning you don't trigger unnecessary layout and you get better performance. So the DX is what? It's JSX. It's the language of React. It's things like use state and use reducer. It's declarative functions that hide away abstraction. It's DX. But React is also a UX tool. And we can talk all day. We can debate about which one is more important. Some would say you can't create great UX without great DX. Again, DX is your experience as a developer. UX is the experience of your customers. Okay? And, and arguably, that matters more in some cases. So I want to spend some time talking about React in the context of UX. But React facilitates good UX through DX. And what is the, what is the thing that makes good UX good? What, what makes an app and a website feel, wow, I love this? Um, one, you get the job done. But two, you get the job done fast. You get the job done well and fast, and it doesn't break. And that performance is key. Uh, web.dev is a great resource for learning about web performance and building on the web. They have an excellent article titled, Milliseconds Make Millions. And it's, it's a brilliant article that outlines the, the, perform the, the role excuse me, performance plays in the web today. Okay? So performance is key. And React is a tool that optimizes for DX and UX. As part of UX, React focuses heavily on performance. Now, is React the most performant library in the world today? Absolutely not. Right? There, there's Wiz that recently merged with Angular from Google. There's um, there's Quick, which is probably the fastest open source UI library in, at the moment. There's Solid, which is faster because it uses fine-grained reactivity and signals. We'll hear about that soon. So it's not the fastest, but it tries to marry DX and UX the best way they know how. Okay? And so if we're talking about performance in React, we have to talk about the fiber architecture introduced in React 16. And this is, all of this is from the book, by the way. Um, Fiber architecture. How many of you are like, in intimately familiar with fiber architecture? Yeah, wow. Okay, cool. This is good. You're learning. So before fiber, so React 15 previously, how reconciliation happened? By the way, reconciliation is you have the actual browser DOM, and you have the virtual DOM. This is your tree of elements. And reconciliation says, I'm going to take this tree that you've described in JSX and reconcile it to the host environment. That's the browser. Okay? So before React 16, that happened using a stack-based data structure. The problem with a stack is it's sequential. It's not interruptible. You can't do stack operations concurrently. And this was an inherent problem because UX interactions are not sequential. For example, filtering a list doesn't directly depend on responding to a user event. You can filter a list based on a network incoming packet, something like that. right? However, typing text into an input field, that needs to be you need to feel that response immediately you cannot like make someone wait okay so there's a sense of priority and so because of that react 16 introduced the fiber architecture that enabled concurrent rendering what does that mean that means you have like a text input field and things happen synchronously that is instantly and things happen asynchronously or concurrently that's like low priority so high priority is i type in an input it updates now low priority is i type in an input the input is recalculated and some network request happens, that doesn't need to happen instantly. It could happen with some delay. And how they do that is borrowing a concept from the game design world called double buffering. In double buffering, you render the next screen off screen, and when it's ready, you put it on screen. So you have two buffers, two video buffers. One the user is seeing, one the user is not seeing. You do the work outside of the user's visibility and then switch. React does this with a fiber reconciler using um, something called a two-phase update. That is a render phase and a commit phase. Render and commit. Is this making sense so far? I hope I'm not losing you. Good. Everybody's nodding. So what does the render phase look like? Assuming you have some UI that you want to react, if you have a counter and somebody presses the click 
clicks the, the increment button, right? A state update happens. React calls a series of functions to render the next state. And again, the next state is rendered off the screen. The users don't see this. It's in the other buffer. So assuming main is the React root, it calls a function called begin work at the top. That function calls begin work, work for the child and the siblings and the child. It just keeps walking down. What does begin work do? It sets flags. It just sets like stateful properties. Should this update? Did this change? Should this update? Should this update? It, do we need to change the element in the host environment? It just sets a bunch of flags on the way down and just keeps walking down the tree and to the side and then down again. Okay? Once it reaches the bottom, complete work is the other side of the function, is the other side of the functionality, put it that way. And what complete work will do is walk back up and look at the flags set by begin work on the way down. And it will, at that point, start reconstructing a new version of the DOM, but like in the second buffer. A user doesn't see this. This happens off the screen. And it happens off the screen in the way that you probably already know. Document.createElement, document.appendChild to just an element tree in browser memory. And this is the render phase. You draw the next state off screen. That's render. Once it's ready to be committed, to the browser that your user is looking at, we enter the commit phase. And the commit phase looks like this. I hope there's enough contrast. So at the very top of the React tree, there's what's called the fiber root node. And this is just a pointer to the current tree, the current buffer. Is it the current state or the next state? And in the commit phase, you basically just flip the pointer. You, instead of pointing to the current state, you point to the next state that was built off screen. And this is really powerful because it allows you to opt in to concurrent rendering. Is this clear so far? So for example, um, we have a really long list, like a million different elements, and the user types something in the text input. Okay? What you can do is update the value of the text input field instantly, but filter the list as a low priority update. That filter, they can see a spinner. That can happen later. But what needs to happen now is the text input needs to update to react to the user. Is that clear? The, the, the user feedback is the highest priority update. And Fiber lets you do that. Why? Because if you're sorting this list and the user types something, the like, sorted list happens off the screen. And the React Reconciler can just throw away that work in progress tree, can throw away the second buffer. We don't need it. The user doesn't need to see it. The user can wait. We can still show a spinner. However, the text field needs to update. So React can, based on a sense of priority, throw away partially done work and prioritize new work. That's, that's the whole point of the fiber architecture and double buffering. Okay? Um, this, you can opt into this. You can use this today. You can unlock the power of concurrent rendering and double buffering in React using two hooks primarily. These are the two hooks. Anyone using these in production so far today? Wow, there's like eight, eight people. How many tickets did you sell? Like 100, 200, 300, eight? That's wild. That's like 4% of you. So hopefully, at the end of this, you're using this where necessary. Use deferred value and use transition. And these are the source of a lot of confusion, a lot of confusion. So today, I want to clear this up for us in the room. Okay? And we'll do that with, of course, with a demo. Okay? So I'm going to go into code mode, because I'm tired of my own voice. And we have Code Sandbox. I've just found out that Code Sandbox has support for GitHub Copilot now, which is so cool. Um, this will probably write itself. OK, so we have just a basic, re basic React app. And what do we want here? Well, we want maybe not a counter, but let's get some data. Let's pretend this is coming from the network. So we'll say you know, array.from. And it's, uh, I don't know, like 300, 400. How about that? 400. And we'll map this to like just math.random. So it's just a like long list of numbers. Um, contrived, but I'm trying to illustrate the mechanism. So let's, let's maybe map this in our mind to like your use case. Okay? Um, let's render this list. So we'll do a UL. And we'll do, wow, thank you, Copilot. We'll do, um, this is actually a bad practice. You're not supposed to use the index as a key. Uh, so in, in a real world case, you have some type of unique ID. Okay? So let's save this. And there, we have a long list. And it's pretty long. Now let's add an input to filter on this. So we'll say const um, query set query. You've, you've all done this before. This is not new. Use state. OK. Just like that. And we'll do an input element. How smart is Copilot? Oh, ho, ho, ho. Um, wow. We're going to lose our jobs to AI. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway. Um, so we have this. And does it work? It doesn't work because data is not filtered. So let's just quickly filter this. Ah, so you don't know that copilot. OK, filter. Um, and OK, here. <laughs> OK. 
Um, so now let's filter for a sequence of numbers in this long random. So we'll do like one, two, three. Okay, this is cool. And it's pretty fast. It's pretty fast because we have like, honestly, we have 400 elements and whatever. This is normal. Um, browsers are powerful and I'm on like an M1 Pro. So let's, let's make it more complex by adding zeros until we crash the browser. <laughs> okay, um, let's go 4,000. How does this work? One, two, three. Okay, it's still performant. And if I type one, two, three in rapid succession, look, like it starts to appear, like one, two, three appears all at once. That's already breaking. Let's add another zero. Um, and we're just simulating, and now it's struggling. Okay, the browser froze a bit. And now if I type one, two, three, I'm gonna put my hands up so you see the delay between I stopped typing and this. So one, two, three. You see that? Let's just try that again, okay. so let's. Yuck, even deleting this is worse because it brings back the 40,000. OK, let's try this again. One, two, three. Yeah, that's, that's not very nice. So how can we opt into concurrent rendering such that filtering the list, that's a low priority update, but responding to my text input, that is high priority because I want it to feel snappy as a user. Well, we can do this with both, use transition and use deferred value. Both of them help you do this. This is actually a case for use deferred value, so we'll start there. How do we do this? Well, let's create a variable called deferred query, literally. And we'll use deferred value of query. So what's happening here? And if we use this now, instead of, like, um, instead of filtering using query, we filter using deferred query. This is not going to solve the problem. Can anyone tell me why? No. This is not going to solve the problem, because when state updates here, all children will re-render, including this. Whether or not the query changes, the moment state changes, this will change. How can we fix that? We we use memo, exactly. So we'll, we'll take this whole component, right? We'll factor it out into a list, okay? Const list, and we'll do this. And of course, list contains the query. Let's just change that reference. And we'll wrap this whole component in react.memo. So now when we do memo, what are we doing? We're saying, even if the parent state changes, never re-render this component, the long list, unless its props change. This, this is something we all need to do. Okay, we're not doing this enough, I'm convinced. And maybe we won't need to because React is working on a compiler that automatically does this. In, in any case, this should be your go-to. Okay? So we'll save this and then we'll, of course, we'll use list here. And we'll pass in the query, just like that. Okay? Um, so we'll save that. And now, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, and now this should be working pretty well. And let's do that. So I'll, again, type one, two, three real quick and then put my hands up. So you see that? Absolutely stunning. So, the, the browser doesn't freeze, but that calculation takes some time. Okay, let's do that again. Um, the browser freezes on the way back, but here. So one, two, three. And it, you see that the list updates just a little bit later. We can make this even better, arguably, by putting a spinner. And I'll explain what's happening here. So we, we could put a spinner because for a certain finite amount of time, deferred query is not the same as the query from the text input because that's deferred like to later. Okay. So what we can do in theory is say this. While deferred query is not the same as query, that means the update is what? Is pending, right? So we can just do that. And now, uh, actually wait, it, what, we have to say loading, excuse me, loading. Otherwise, um, so if it's not the same, this was, this was a mistake. Okay, so here. So if, they're not, if they don't match, then we're loading, otherwise they're, they're fine. So now, if I update this and do like one, two, three, yeah, really rapidly, you see that it starts loading. If we add more zeros, this is going to get way, way worse. So let's just maybe add, I'm scared to crash the browser. I'll just double this, how about that, eight. Okay, let's uh, save. So it's about to crash, perfect. This is the moment, you know, this is the anticipation, come on. Okay, okay, so, so far so good. I'm gonna, it, you, we should ideally see loading, so. Yeah, look at that. And it's taking long, but the text input responded to me instantly. Do you see that? That's the power of use deferred value. Okay, let's talk about what's happening here. What is this magic? So who's familiar with debounce, debouncing? Yeah, all of you. This is that, sort of. With debouncing, what do you do? You say, hey, if a keystroke comes in before some timeout, then cancel whatever it is. Like in the case of a network request, type a keystroke, Request is pending. Oh, another keystroke within 300 milliseconds. Okay, cancel the request and do another one. Something like that. Or another way of doing debounce is you just wait. You wait until the user stops timing, uh, stops typing. Excuse me. But 
you, how long do you wait? That is the difference between use deferred value and debounce. It's just how long you wait. With debounce, you set the time, 300 milliseconds, 600, whatever it may be. With use deferred value, you don't set the time, React sets the time. So the React scheduler is responsible for scheduling updates. It's in the name. And if you put something in use deferred value, it will schedule the update of that value where it's used. So it will schedule the update of deferred query much later. So it's like debounce, except the time is not set by you. It's set by React. And the criteria is, is there more urgent work? What is more urgent work? Text input, responding instantly to a user. Okay, I hope you understand now use deferred value and where to use it. Typically, you would use it in place of a debounce, but you want to respond to React, not some arbitrary time. This is a great way to do a loading state. It's just like, while the pending state is not the same as the current state, I'm loading. Okay? That's use deferred value. Let's talk about use transition, and we'll wrap up. You can actually model very similar behavior with both of these. So if we switch this to use transition, we have, let's, let's create a transition. So we'll say is pending and start transition. This is the signature for use transition. And how would you do it? Well, we'd use an effect here. And I know we all hate use effect, whatever. Um, but we can say that when the actual text input query changes, then we start a transition to set the deferred. And this is basically how use deferred value probably works under the hood. So we'll say deferred query is a state piece, right? And we set deferred query to the query in a transition, right? So start transition has the power of taking that function and saying, hey, React, schedule this for later. So whatever happens in that function, why is that tooltip there? Whatever happens here, React will just deprioritize. That's all. So this is very similar behavior. And the only difference is, instead of our loading state being some condition, we just do is pending. But in theory, this should be exactly the same. Um, I'm scared to run it, but we'll see. Because it's 40,000, 80,000 80, rows. So yeah, so we have is pending, it's loading, and it updates. And they both help you do the same thing, except you use transition and start transition is for functions that do a lot more. And use deferred value is the same thing, but for just a value. Is that clear? Um, this unlocks what? This unlocks exceptional user experience. Because look, it's so responsive. I typed one, two, three, and it updated. And this is 80,000 rows. Like in, real, in the real world, we probably have virtualization and stuff. So that's the case here. So again, look at this. It's beautiful. Not once is the browser freezing for me. Um, really great work. I'm always in the know. In fact, I had the privilege once of doing a course on human-computer interaction from um, Stanford University. And they taught us that rule number one of UX is to always make sure the user knows the state of the system. The user must always know the state of the system. So if it's loading, the user should somehow know it. Ideally, there's no layout shift. Ideally, there's a little like pulsing spinner, et cetera. Okay? Um, I hope that helps. Does that help? Does that teach you something you didn't know about React? Show me. Uh, OK, I see hands. That's cool. Wow, everybody. Good. Mission accomplished. Now, I have seven minutes. This is great. Now we can talk about the book stuff. Um, <laughs> why not? I'm glad. We had a sense. This is meta. You know why? We had a sense of priority here in this talk. I think we used deferred value, but like <laughs> wild. OK, so uh, briefly about the book. I just want to share maybe one small thing with you as a takeaway. And this is a great way to wrap up the talk as well. Um, I had a dream about writing this book. <laughs> you, you laugh, but like when I was 15 years old, when my career started, I saw people writing books with O'Reilly, specifically O'Reilly. I saw the animals on the cover, and I was like, wow, that is so cool. Sarah Drasner wrote a book with O'Reilly. Um, all these people, Kyle Simpson wrote a book with O'Reilly. These people I look up to, my heroes. And I was like, That's, how do I do that? I want to do that. I want to write a book. Um, of course, today, you know, um, I did. But I think that's, that's, that's extremely profound. Because when I was looking into it, I, I Googled it. How do I write a book with O'Reilly? And you know, what the, you know what the answer was that I found? You just have to know someone. You, just, like, you go to a conference, and, and maybe you meet someone, and they make a connection. It's networking. Um, and I thought, I have absolutely no chance if that's the case. This was, I was 15 years old. I was never speaking at conferences. And so I thought, I have absolutely no chance. I, I live in Qatar. I grew up in Qatar. I, was, I wasn't even close to Europe or the US where like, the action is, unfortunately. Right? And so I was like, how, how can I do this? And I just thought, you know what? I give up. This is never going to happen for me. 
I, I, th this is for someone else. And I was thinking, yet here I am, and I was thinking, how, how did we get here? It's weird, it's, I'm not even, it's like very strange. Um, and so I thought maybe I can share what helped me, and this maybe helps you. I don't know if you're thinking about writing a book. Maybe you're a senior engineer thinking about going staff or principal. Maybe you want to make some transition, pun intended, um, in your life, right? For me, what helped was to just prepare. To prepare to write a book with O'Reilly, even though I couldn't. What does that mean? Um, for me, I just did stuff in that general area. Sure, you need to meet people, fine, I'll go to meetups. I'll do a talk, I'll whatever. Now, it's important to note that there was a level of outcome independence here. Like, I didn't think I'm gonna do all this for that outcome. I, I didn't care if I got the O'Reilly book or not. I was just like, I don't care about the outcome, I'm just going to do the work, irrespective of the outcome. That has served me very, very well. One more thing, if you're trying to speak at conferences or write a book or something, I wanna share with you the best advice, and this is just because we have five minutes, honestly. Um, I wanna share with you the best advice that I ever got as a speaker. My first large conference talk, JSConf EU, there was over a thousand people. Um, one of the organizers came to me and said, hey, can I, I believe in you as a speaker. I want to give you some advice that will take you far. And I said, yeah, I want it, it's my first talk. And his advice was, pick a topic, any topic, and just like go as deep as possible. And if you want examples of this in the wild, I mean, my book is that, like it's literally like React source code and maybe a little bit under, but I think Josh Como, you, you'll hear from Josh shortly. I mean, he has a blog post titled How to Center a Div. That's the title. And you may think, okay, display flex, uh, align item center, uh, justify content center, done. But it's like over, like, I think it's 10,000 words or something about how this works. And that's the kind of content I try to create. That's the kind of content we create for, for you. And so if that's something you want to do, um, I'd recommend it. Okay, let's wrap up and talk about the final question that's on everybody's mind. Like, why a book? Like, we have the website, we have internet. Why? Like, we have ChatGPT, I can learn from anything. Do books matter? Should I write one? And let's do, let's do a quick experiment. Let's play a game, books versus internet. Now, we know the internet is good, absolutely, right? Um, there's a ton of information, but that's sort of the problem, that there's a ton of information. And I wish that when I want to learn something, somebody comes alongside me and says, read this. Okay, you got that? Okay, now, now read this. You got that? Now read this. It, I wish there was curation. And books do that. And content creators do that. So, so people like Josh Como, people like Kent C. Dodds, people like Mark Erickson, they all have blogs, and these blogs are chef's kiss, but the problem is they're disparate. And it'd be cool if somebody could like pull articles from all of them and put it in sequence and give it to me. Books do that, right? Um, they, they don't plagiarize, I'm not saying that, but they, they curate information. I've just written React over 10 years and I put it in chapters the best I knew how. Okay? Number two, books are rigorously reviewed. I wanna be very clear, a lot of people are giving me credit for this book. I did not write this book alone. Um, Fabian is sitting there, he helped review the book. He gave me examples. Um, Mark Erickson, Rick Handlin from the core team of React on Meta, um, Mateus Albuquerque, Attila, who's one of the speakers here, like all these folks, Daniel Afonso, they all weighed in and said, hey, this, I don't understand this, can we clarify this? That's not accurate, that's just wrong. Angular is better. Um, <laughs> and they, they were reviewed so hard by my friends and peers, but also by experts. And the internet, unfortunately, sometimes things miss review. Sometimes you think, um, you know, what, what, eating Tide Pods is good for your pandemic issues. I don't, like the internet is dangerous and books are, are not. And again, the internet is good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just making a case for the trade-offs. And number three, books unfortunately are time sensitive. My book is gonna be outdated in a week. I bet you, I bet. Um, but there will just be a second edition, maybe a third edition. It's okay, it's updatable. The internet is, is not just time sensitive. Sometimes it's too early. I would much rather information be too late than too early. What do I mean by too early? Um, everybody's like scared of losing their job now um, because there's a thing called Devon that can like make apps. Like it's an AI that runs VS Code and a terminal and a browser. And people are like, oh my gosh. This is but here's the deal, this is a private beta. Like only like 10 people have access to this. And so everybody's sort of forming opinions too early and I just wanna make the case like books or internet, why not both? Right? We have an ecosystem, everything has trade-offs, and at the end of the day, they're just tools. Okay, to summarize and wrap up, a couple things. One, we talked about preparing for the future you want with outcome independence. Oops, <laughs> that's my presentation. Number two, um, books are cool, the internet's cool, 
we're blessed with information. And three, I hope you have some real takeaways from React around developer experience through use transition and use deferred value, as well as how they can impact user experience by using the scheduler in a very intelligent way. Okay? This was 25, 30 minutes. Um, believe me, I, I, I can talk more. Um, and I do. I have a podcast where we go into deep detail. Each episode, I'm not even kidding, is like nearly two hours. And it, it is very, very detailed. So don't, don't scan the QR code if, if you're not ready for that. Um, but, but I do want to make that available to you as well because I care about you as a community and I want you to be able to do your best work. And with that, thank you so much for having me here at React Paris. <laughs>